This film, this film is filthy. You know what's incredible about the germ thing and the wipe thing? If you read your directions on any disinfectant wipes, they have to sit wet for over five minutes oh, to yeah. be completely disinfected. Oh, yeah. So I, I'm accidentally kind, not like a clean freak, but I like things that are clean. Like when I clean them, I want them to stay clean, right? Yeah. Um, there is a cool company out there. Which and I'm is not, why you were cleaning our studio. Right, right no. Um, and I organize things. I'm just, I'm one of those, oh, there's not room for it. Let's reorganize it and make it fit. I love puzzles. I love the things. Um, but there's a company called Norwex out there that actually gets the bacteria protein off of surfaces with a wipe of the towel. Um, and there's local distributors and things. It's kind of like the Mary Kay of cleaning. Um, and I participate in that more so than I do Lysol wipes and things like that because I know they're immediately disinfected rather than making them sit wet. Um, anyways, welcome to Wired Wednesday. This is McKinnon Hansen. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to join us on Facebook, it's Wired Wednesday with McKinnon Hansen. And in studio today, I have Scott Stubbs, who is the Iron County Farm Bureau Federation president, and he is also a local sheep and cowman. No, no more cows. Just sheep. Just sheep. Not just sheep. Sheep is a whole... Sheep only. It's a whole chore in and of itself. Sheep exclusive. Yes. Sheep exclusive. Sheep. That's it. <laughs> And, you know, I just want to put it out there. We are also looking for vendors for the Iron County Fair to do um, <clears throat> ag education in a booth capacity. We're calling it the Ag Barn. And anything that you have, demonstrate, sell, buy, whatever, for kind of a farm to product or farm to um, plate type activity, we would love to chat and see if we can fit you in the barn. Um, I know a few Parowanites that would love to participate already. So if you guys are out there or if somebody knows anybody who really takes a farm product and goes all the way through to the product, um, that or, would be Or excellent. anybody that has any educational thing to kind of go along with where your food comes from and things like that. We'd like to get all things agriculture in the, in the barn. Already. In the barn. Perfect. So one... Uh, over this last kind of week, I've been really curious about my genealogy. And in Iron County specifically... Oh, I know some people that can help you with that. I know. But it's really curious to me. You know, I know a lot about my genealogy, considering my age group doesn't really... It's not their forte, right? They don't do a lot of research. They don't pass stories on. Or if they have, they've forgotten them, you know, and those types of things. So I got looking into my genealogy specifically, and... My family goes back to 1851 in Iron County, and, and that means something. We were some of the families, founding families of the Parowan Valley, who then moved later to Cedar Fort and then established Cedar City. And Parowan still holds the county seat. Yes. Right? Yes. And originally, our county was named the Little Salt Lake Valley, or Little Salt Lake County. Mm because the, of the Little Salt Lake Lake in Parowan. Right, Scott? Right, right. So it's really incredible how, how one, my family goes back almost 200 years, so 180-ish years, and that's at least, I want to say at least seven generations. I think your family went back before they came here, too, so I guess they go back a long ways. Well, you know. <laughs> I got here somehow, but I know that when Henry Lunt was called um, by the religious organization, they they established Cedar City. He moved here and was discovering it in 1851, and our family, in in some capacity, has always resided in Iron County. And it's incredible because we got I got talking with another uh, another gal the other day, and our our lines crossed or our. Our families lived in the same random Southern California town back in the 50s, you know, and she moved here in the 80s and my mom moved here in the 70s, you know, and whatnot. But it's almost like people are being called home. It's, it's kind of funny, but, but you, people will move back to your town or whatever and you'll get talking to them and, well, yeah, but my great, great granddad came from here. But Okay, but you're several generations away, but they do seem like they come home. Uh, right. And, and having those neighborly conversations or those discovery moments is really, really critical to the lifestyle that we also have here in Iron County, I would say. 
the majority of us still like dirt roads. Oh, I did have to ask one of our commissioners the other day if we'd lost all our graders, but I've seen them working, so they <laughs> do still have them. They've been plowing <laughs> snow, don't you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> those Anyway, it's been, been a rough winter and we've had a lot of moisture. We've been blessed with a lot of moisture and the moisture has caused a lot of problems also, which is just part of part of what happens, you know. No, and completely agreed. It's it's really critical to our area that we're continuing those relationships, you know, and continuing building on those relationships and building, you know, where we can call our county commissioner. We have their direct line of, hey, what's going on? I didn't see that this was done. Or, hey, did you know there was a 10 by 10 pothole on such and such road? You know, you yeah. go through that. But that kind of still happens in Iron County. Yeah. Yeah, our commissioners, if you work with them and talk to them, they are very re receptive to you, and they will try and try and help you, you know, where they can. Which goes back to relationships. Yes. yes. Right? Making sure we have critical relationships built on trust, right? Yes. Not not fear, not scarcity, not um, anger, but those relationships built out of genuine good, you know, to progress Iron County in those. So, so to go along with that, right now, water is a big discussion. And I mean, it's hard to believe with the record snow year we've had and everything, but but water is a problem here. And we've got mayors of about every town in Iron County working with farmers, with citizens, trying to take care of our water and get more out of it. And it's really encouraging to see them all come together and push for the same thing. Um, with that, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit today about what's going on in, in our mountains and, and on our desert ranges. There's a lot of water restoration projects going on, range improvements, you can call them, and you think, well, that just benefits the livestock. No, it benefits wildlife, livestock, but it also quits growing weeds with our water. Unfortunately, pinion juniper stands are weeds. They, they are, with too much of them is not a good thing. We lose too much of our valuable resource into, into those. And right now on the Dixie National Forest, there's a lot of projects going on. There was a big block of money sent to Pine Valley down there for, they're gonna do timber projects and, awesome. and pinion juniper, and that's really gonna help. But that is also freed up a little bit of money that they're sending back over, like this year they start over to Paraguna on the north cattle allotment over there. Next year it goes to, to the south allotment. The next year they're doing a project over the mountain on my summer range. But all of this is very important to maximize our water. That's what we need to do is maximize the flow of our water to get it in the aquifers and where we can use it. I understand, uh, I, in fact, I just put up a, uh, an article on our website yesterday that the uh, DWR just had allocated to uh, it three point four million dollars for wildlife habitat and waterfowl habitat improvements, and I'm sure some of that will come to um, the Peril and Front one. Mm -hmm. uh, although I think it's going to be a long time before people are going up that road this year. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 we have a transmitter for one of our sister stations up on Pine Springs. No, I've talked to the engineer. I said, "When do you think you can be updated?" He said, "Probably not until July." So yeah. Yeah. it's going to be a while before we're traipsing around up there. This year. So an interesting thing about these watershed restorations projects, you've got a lot of participants. You've got, like if it's on BLM, you got the BLM. Right. A lot of the time you got the permittee that's doing a lot of, can come up with money to go towards it. You've got the DWR, they're very active in it. They do a, they do a good job. We, we really have got a lot going on. So I guess my point of bringing this up is anytime you see a chance to comment and promote water projects, Please do, because it's for the benefit of the citizens of the towns also. It's not just going to help some farmer, or, or it's not going to just help a hunter. It's going to help us all. We need the water. Well, and just like the Great Salt Lake and everybody, you know, blaming, well, not blaming. Well, no, yes, they have blamed agriculture for the Great Salt Lake's, you know, deficiency. However, they don't look at where the water comes from, which is typically the mountains and the snowpack, right? 
the overgrowth, the stopping of forest fires because of residential influx, you know, in those areas, the different things that go associated with that, it, water is one of those things. If you have ever been to a third grade science fair, somebody does water, you know, where it comes from, how it cycles, all of those things. And a lot of that goes through erosion, you know, or erosion control and those types of things. But it also goes back into the aquifers, you know, when, once upon a time, and I don't know if this is actually true or not, but the Tusher Mountains in Beaver, theoretically, all of that snowpack, which some of it stays year round, um, it goes into fill underground aquifers, and the funnel goes basically through Minersville Lake and out into the Burrow Valley, and then circles back into Gunlock and down through the gorge. Yeah. Now so I don't know if connect. that's really I, true. I believe that you're that that's probably true. I mean, if the aquifers are full enough, it spills. Right, and you it know, there's underground the shelves that hold the water here and there, and different things. So, yeah. Well, and a lot of people don't know, you know, where the water feeds. Like most of the Rocky Mountain drainage system, like the whole like across Colorado and Utah, goes into Lake Powell, which also feeds into Lake um, Mead and Lake Mojave, and down through all of that, right? And it feeds states that aren't even associated with the snowpack. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah, it's kind of funny. One day in in church, the bishop had asked us to pray for moisture. We was having drought, which we've had a lot of lately, and and he says, I don't really understand that, but the bishop wants us to. The elders call him president, and and anyway, he, he says, but I'm from Las Vegas, and I don't really understand that because we never needed rain, and I thought you're drinking our rain down there, whether you know it or not. What happens in Colorado, Utah, Wyoming affects. Clear to California, clear to into Mexico. So then, this is a great tie back too of the cyclicalness of a lot of things that people do, and they don't realize where they're at in the wheel or where the step before them was. So let's take a sheep, okay? What products does one sheep produce? Oh, geez, we we get into all sorts of things with the sheep. But more than one. Yeah, yeah. So so like, you know, rattlesnake bite venom is produced through sheep, for one thing. Lotion, lanolin, you know, we have wool, we have meat, but there's so much that the bright products are used, you know, the- It's a useful. fully utilized yeah. Yeah. product mm -hmm. or animal, correct? Yeah. Correct. So, and then you take that through all the different industries that we live and thrive on, right? Mm -hmm. That's just one animal, and there's, I would say, easily a hundred different products from that one animal that, yes. you know, compound into each other and out of each other, right? Yeah, yeah, baseballs. They're made out of, out of wool. So, there you go. Baseballs. We couldn't play baseball America's favorite pastime sport. <laughs> it's, a, it's the only sport that I almost pay attention to. Now, my previous <laughs> boss would, Come you know. Come to Salt Lake City, no one believes, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always been coming, right? Right. But it's, it's really incredible if we stop and just look around us. Now, granted, we're not out in the field, Scott, which I apologize for. Someday we're going to have a radio show that is out in the wind and rain oh, and elements. Oh, jeez. Someday. You won't be able to hear anything out well. the way the wind's been lately. <laughs> Long after I don't work here. <laughs> right. <laughs> but so we're in a studio, but we can look around there. Look around this. There's, there's wood framing. There's sheetrock, which comes from gypsum. You know the gypsum mine up the up the Cedar Valley Canyon right now, or not Cedar Valley, I or blah blah, blah. Highway 14, right? That new gypsum mine that's been there for a few years now. You know all of these products that we're in a building for, even the plastics, you know, are derivatives of of oil mining or mm -hmm. oil drilling yes. and those types of things and refinery systems. Um, the glasses we have, the the computers are mined and milled. Some things, everything yeah. comes from. Comes from the earth, basically. Everything's got to come from the earth. Right, and it's our job as as stewards or participants, right, to make sure that it's at its highest and best use. Yes. You know, same thing with water, the highest and best use. Yes. Right. So if we're feeding, if we're feeding Iron County, right, the highest and best use of the water is almost less recreation and more productivity. Yeah, yeah, but you know, there can be a lot of recreation if we take care of it correctly. You know, like, like you mentioned Lake Powell. Look at all the food that's growing off the Colorado River. 
but look at all the recreation that does happen in Lake Powell. So it can go hand in hand. Oh no, and I'm saying it, it's more of a, it's more people coming together to create a win-win situation, yes. not a win-loss. And, and you know, in our forest, we're on watershed, we need to grow timber because like you mentioned, we do need wood and I'd like to see our, our timber industry come back because when we lost our timber industry around here, it, it really took a lot of jobs and a lot of, lot of economic engine out of the communities but we need to get our forests in a more healthy state you can't grow 200 trees per acre and have it healthy you cannot grow a saw log that thick you know right and us and you need saw logs because you can't make lum uh, you can't make a board out of a twig you know you can make a little pole and that's about all you can make out of out of a when it's 200 trees per acre they're so thick that they can't get the get the volume the the depth that they need. Yeah, yeah. So, the so, so water, yeah, the circumference, the girth, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is this is an important thing. And uh, in a conversation, a guy said, "My job is to manage the the coal creek and different things. Your job is to get the flow coming." Well, all of us need to work on the flow as we look at our at our foothills with these juniper trees on them. You notice there's not very much grass up there. Very true. I think of if we could if we could get rid of part of those, then there would be grass. The grass helps put the water in the ground. It helps keep it from running. You know, the when soil it, from yeah, running from the erosion the from the big floods. I mean, I'm not saying that the flood that flooded Enoch would have been stopped if it would have all been covered in grass, but it definitely would have helped slow that down where under those trees, it's just bare ground and there's nothing to slow it down, nothing to help but soak in, it just runs. And well, and it goes back to, you know, where, if we step back in each of our own individual lives, right? What can we do? You know, where, do, where does our industry or where does our job or where does our passion fall within the greater cycle of our area? You know, if I'm just a school teacher, do I have a part to play in this? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you start, you, you're in, you have the great skill set to educate young minds. Yes. You know, in whatever you're passionate about, but helping, even just having them know where their food comes from, mm -hmm. right? Ag yeah. education. Or did you know trees do this? Or did you know that this area produces X, Y, and Z? You, you have a huge skill set in that. So for those of you listening that don't think you have a part in this, you, you can find your part somewhere. Oh, yes. Every, everybody. Everybody has a part to play in, in the, in the things that we need to make our lives go on as they are. I, you know, we got to have water. We can't take all the water from food because we got to have food. And, uh, and Iron County does matter. If you take agriculture out of Iron County, it will affect the food supply. Well, and that goes into, you know, there's a lot going on, especially in Utah County right now. They just got some legislative passed um, locally that's putting over 270 acres into protected ag space where it will always continue to be farmed and it cannot be developed. There's some ideas of that for yeah, Iron County. Yeah, yeah. and there, there is a program that, that you can put it in a conservation easement, they call them, to, to make sure it always stays in ag, you know. And uh, we need to protect our ag ground we definitely do. You know, and as in the last few minutes of the show, I was talking well, to somebody. I, I'm sorry, I have to ask a question though. Yeah. On that. If that ag, okay, are you talking about publicly held agricultural land or privately held agricultural land? Both. Both. Okay. So you're saying that as, I, as a landowner in this case, couldn't sell my land to a developer if I wanted to? So, so if you go into something like the conservation easement on your private land, you can't do it on public land. But if you go into that, then you choose to do that. And then that takes away the development rights permanently. Well, what if the landowner doesn't want to do that? He doesn't have well, okay. then he doesn't it's, have it's to. They can opt it, out. And, I, and oh, I'm okay. not trying to take away private property rights okay. to do with as you, okay. as you want. But I would like to see us, I don't know. Everybody thinks agriculture, the farmers are making a lot of money. We're really not making a lot of money. Oh, I know. I and, I, and I wish that we could do a little better so that we can make sure we kept it in there. That's what drives the whole thing right. in the end is money. Because, like everything in, in our life. Because I've heard, I, I mean, secondhand, but I've heard, you know, the, that some will have sold the land because they 
make that look very handsome price for it. Sure, sure. Well, right, and and it's not that I'm I'm trying to tell people not to sell their land to developers, but if they want to see future generations use their land as agriculture, then they need to step forward yeah. and protect that. Yeah. There's some families in, in the Federation that I know of that are going on their seventh and eighth generation farms. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to protect that for future development, because we never know whose mind's gonna get changed, then you can start with small steps like yeah. putting it into yeah. a conservation. But it's, it's gotta be something, whoever controls that because it is their private property, they've got to choose to do it. And, and I wouldn't support any other way, but I just, I, I are very concerned as I see our farm ground being built on and stuff. How, how food production looks in the future, who knows? There will probably be some greenhouse things that come along that use our water differently than we do now. And that might be a huge benefit. Um, you know, we're, we're definitely conserving as citizens in our yards and stuff, we're going more zero scape and different things, trying to conserve our water. Right. It just, it's just a united effort on, on water. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining us for Wired Wednesday. I've really appreciated you all of your time. a minute today because Craig said he can't do his last report. Oh, yay, I get one more minute, so 60 seconds to explain <laughs> who I really am. Um, I'm McKenna Hansen, your local Farm Bureau Financial Insurance Agent and your local KW with the Larkin Group real estate agent. My number is 435-592-2021. Like we started the show off, I am very passionate about making sure Iron County stays Iron County and why people are coming back. They're coming back for a reason and they're coming back to their roots. So let's keep our roots with the water all intact and going through the different ebbs and flows of life. Let's do it together. Let's create win-win situations where where we can maintain our lifestyle here in Iron County while growing and developing where we should. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining us. So thank when, you when for are you having me. you going to get your law degree? Yeah. My law degree? I mean, that's the one thing you're lacking. You need real estate, insurance. Might as well become a lawyer, too. You know, somebody told me I should be a lawyer at 10 years old because I was that good at arguing and persuading somebody. I just don't have the time yet. I have a th and and quick shout out to my daughter. Her birthday is tomorrow, you know, and my son's is um, on Saturday. I was gonna do that at the beginning of the show and I totally spaced it. But the law degree takes two years of dedicated work in a legal office and being a paralegal. I do have two. I do have my degrees from SUU. I have a bachelor's of finance and a master's of public administration. Um, so I'm probably the most uneducated insurance agent out there. Um, or over educated. I was going to say that. Over educated. Over educated. Um, Phone number? Thank you so much for joining us. 435 592 2021. All right, see you next week.